Can you please stand for the national anthem? Thank you, Jonathan. Please remain standing. I now invite Father Marcin Rumek as, to ask God's blessing on this evening's lecture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let's bow our heads and place ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering all of us today. May you bestow your guidance and blessings on this event so that we can enjoy and appreciate its significance in our lives, in the lives of the people of Grenada. Fill us with your grace, Lord God, and continue to remind us that all that we do here today, all that we accomplish, is for the pursuit of truth, for the greater glory of you, and for the service of humanity. We ask all of these in, your, in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Marcin. You may have a seat. Well, good evening again, everyone. I am happy to see so many of you here this evening. My name is Keisha Branch, and I am the program officer for the University of the West Indies Open Campus Grenada, and your chair for this evening's lecture. Welcome to the fifth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. Our theme for this year's lecture is Children Go to School and Learn Well challenges with education in the Caribbean. At this time, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Nicole Philip Dow, who is the head of the University of the West Indies Open Campus Grenada, to formally welcome you to this evening's lecture. Dr. Philip Dow. Ambassador Chao Yong Chen, People's Republic of China, His Excellency Dr. Didicus Jules, Director General of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, and our feature speaker, Honorable Emmeline Peer, Minister for Education, Human Resource Development, and Religious Affairs, Honorable Pamela Moses, Minister for Tertiary Education, Skills Development, and Education Outreach, Mr. Franklin Redhead, Deputy Commissioner of the Royal Grenada Police Force, and one of our speakers for this evening. Mrs. Chrissy Worm Charles, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Social Development and Housing. Mr. Alva Brown, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Bishop Clive Martin Harvey, Bishop of St. George's. Archdeacon Michael Marshall, of St. George's Anglican Church and his lovely wife. Mr. Richard Duncan, Managing Director of Grenada Cooperative Bank. 
Mr. Anthony Andal, representing the Provost of St. George's University. Father Marcin Rumick, Parish Priest, Blessed Sacrament Church, Guanance. Mr. James Bristol, attorney and son of our beloved Mr. Carol Bristol, the late Carol Bristol, members of our advisory committee of the University of the West Indies, principals of secondary schools, primary schools, teachers, lecturers of UE and SGU, members of the Bar Associ Grenada Bar Association, students, SGU, University of the West Indies, Tam CC, I'm seeing girl guides. Welcome to everyone. Good evening, everyone. Yes, it's a long introduction. I hope I didn't miss anybody. The University of the West Indies Open Campus Grenada warmly welcomes you to the fifth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. The lecture series falls in line with our AAA strategy of access, alignment, and agility. Through this lecture series, we are seeking to align ourselves with the needs of our community by providing a platform for intellectual discourse on topical issues. Give me a moment to tell you a few things about UWI. Within the last year, our university has been named by Times Higher Education Ranking as the only Caribbean university to be named the best in the world, number one in the Caribbean. Sorry, number one in the Caribbean. I, I'm, I'm stepping over myself. No, we're not the best in the world just yet. Number one in the Caribbean, sorry. In the top 2% in Latin America and the top 4% in the world. I'm hoping we get to the, be the number one soon. It, was, it is a feat that we are truly proud of. We opened within the last year our fourth landed campus, that's the Five Islands Campus in Antigua, offering degrees in health and behavioral science, human, humanities, education, the sciences, and in technology. The university has also extended its outreach internationally with partnerships and have, no, have established a number of institutes across the world. For example, liaisons have been made with the University of Lagos in Nigeria, University of Johannesburg in South Africa, the University of Glasgow, the University of Coventry in the UK, the University of Miami in the US, and one of our universities in Latin America as well. At home in Grenada, we are now serving 452 online students 14 of whom come from the sister island of Karakou. Our students are currently completing bachelor's and master's degrees as well as PhDs. And one of our PhD students, we are proud to say, is from the sister island of Karakou. We also offer professional development courses each semester and we have recently partnered with the Ministry of Education to provide a certificate in early childhood education for 47 teachers. And I'm going to do some um, advertising while I'm here. So <laughs> in the upcoming semester, we're looking forward to offering customer service, the art of public speaking, and the introduction to marketing. So for all those who are interested, you can sign up after. Just kidding. This year, our lecture focuses on the challenges faced in the field of education in our region. And we thought that the most fitting person to speak on this matter is His Excellency Dr. Didicus Jules, and he graciously acquiesced to our request. I think he likes Grenada. We are happy once again to partner for the fifth time with one of Grenada's most noteworthy corporate sponsors, the Grenada Cooperative Bank. We are truly grateful for Cooperative Bank's willingness to work with us in promoting education in our community, and we wish to sincerely thank the Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited for its sponsorship. We are happy to continue this lecture in the name of Mr. Carol Bristol, former chairman of our Territorial Advisory Committee and former tutor of UWI. We want to thank his family, especially Mr. James Bristol for accepting our invitation to attend this year. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the fifth annual Carol Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you so much for coming and do enjoy this evening's lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nicole Philip Dell. The Grenada Cooperative Bank has been a major sponsor for the, this event for the last five years. Please join me in welcoming Manager of Customer Care of the Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited, Mr. Richard Duncan, to make some brief remarks. Pleasant evening. Just one correction, uh, Roger Duncan. <laughs> In the essence of time, I wish to stand on the protocol already established. Again, pleasant evening to all. It gives me great pleasure to stand before you on behalf of Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited as we await the fifth Carol Bristol Distinguished lecture series. The bank is very pleased to once again be associated with this event. Support for educational development has been one of the main areas of the bank's community involvement over the years. We have always aspired to bring cultural, historical, and intellectual awareness to the community we serve, as evident by several of the activities we sponsor and support, such as the annual Carl Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series, the annual W.E. Julian Memorial Lecture, and the annual SGU Knowledge Bowl Secondary School Quiz, just to name a few. Being the only indigenous commercial Grenadian bank, and one of the largest by asset size in the state of Grenada, we are pleased to be associated to this year's event once again and host to Dr. Didicus Jules, a radical regional and ed an international educator and a revolutionary by nature to address the subject, children go to school and learn well, challenges with education in the Caribbean. These challenges have haunted our thoughts for many years amidst the evolving global environment with shifting paradigms that present an imminent marginalization sorry, of our people in one space, one global space. There's a few among men that possess the in-depth scholastic acumen in our opinion that can get us to critically think of the new fundamentals of education, an exercise that fully merits the bank's support. On behalf of the management and staff of Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited, I wish to extend congratulations to the University of the West Indies Open Campus for hosting yet again this year's Co-op Bank sponsored fifth Carl Bristol Distinguished Lecture Series and welcome home, Dr. Didicus Jules. We invite everyone to enjoy this evening's lecture and discussions, which promise to be educated, enlightening, and thought provoking. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Roger Duncan. I'm truly sorry. We shall now have a short musical interlude. I'd like to welcome Mr. Jonathan Ramirez.
Thank you very much, Jonathan. I now re-invite Dr. Nicole Philip Dow to introduce our featured speaker. Let me say a warm good evening to our Honorable Minister for Foreign Affairs, Honorable Peter David, and our leader of the National Democratic Congress, Mrs. Franca Bernadine. Welcome. His Excellency, Dr. Didicus Jules, assumed the post of Director General of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States in May of 2014. Dr. Jules has had extensive regional and international experience, most of it focused on education, social policy, and organizational transformation. He has served as Registrar and Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Examination Council, 2008 to 2014, Permanent Secretary for Education and Human Resource Development in St. Lucia, 1997 to 2008, and the one we know most of, Permanent Secretary for Education and Chief Exec um, Education Officer in the period of the PRG in Grenada, 1981 to 1983. He is also a UWI graduate, and he holds a, a master's degree in curriculum and, curriculum and instruction, and a PhD in educational policy and curriculum and instruction from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has authored a number of articles on education policy, educational reform, and adult education in the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, let us warmly welcome home to Grenada, Dr. Didicus Jules. The ambassador Chao Yong Chen of the Republic of China, the Honorable Emmeline Pierre, Minister of Education, etc., the Honorable Pamela Moses, Minister for Tertiary Education, the Honorable Peter David, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mrs. Franca Bernadine, the former Minister of Education, Mr. Edwin Martin, Commissioner of the Royal Grenada Police Force, Mr. Franklin Redhead, Deputy Commissioner. Mrs. Wom Charles, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Development and Housing. Mr. Kevin Andal, PS, Education, Human Resource Development. Bishop Clyde Martin Harvey. Mr. Richard Duncan, Dr. Anthony Andal, Father Marcin Rumick. Mr. Jimmy Bristol, son of Mr. Carol Bristol, members of the UE. Territorial Advisory Committee, principals of secondary and primary schools, lecturers, teachers, members of the Grenada Bar Association, other specially invited guests, and most importantly, in my view, students, because after all, they chose Sparrows in addressing you, right? Um, let me begin by just honoring the memory of the late Carl Bristol. I have specially fond memories of him and a great deal of respect. Mr. Bristol was the one who was responsible for getting me my Grenada passport after my ejection from Grenada. <laughs> so, <clears throat> make sure this works. Is this on? Right. So we know the words of the famous Calypso by the mighty sparrow. But the opening lines of this, in the opening lines of this Calypso, sparrow asserts that education, I could sing it, but I don't want it to rain, but education, 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 this is the foundation. Our rising population needs sound education. To be recognized anywhere that you go, you've got to have a certificate to show. To enjoy any kind of happiness, knowledge is the key to success. Many of our Calypsonians have sung about the importance of education in the Caribbean and its importance in shaping the future that we want and the prosperity that we need. The mighty Sparrow himself has several Calypsos on education. Among them is the well-known School Days, in which he celebrates the nostalgic victory, in which he celebrates 
the nostalgic joy of school days as happy days. In Dan is the man in the van, he laments the irrelevance of a colonial education. And he says, according to the education that you get, when you're small, you will grow up with true ambition and respect for one and all. In my days in school, they teach me like a fool. The things they teach me, I should be a blockheaded fool. From Calypso to academia, the challenge of education in the Caribbean is becoming an interminable conversation that doesn't seem to be leading anywhere because the critique has been repeated over and over and over again, spanning the same thematic. We talk about relevance of curriculum, student performance, teacher capability, vision and leadership, the effectiveness of pedagogy. In spite of the extensive critique, education is one of the sectors of human development in the Caribbean that has proven to be the most difficult to change. Why is this so? In my experience, I've found that educators have often been the sharpest resistors to change. There's an unyielding adherence to the old inherited canons, a belief that what is considered to be what they call the true and the tested should never be abandoned for the experimental and the investigational. The irony of this contradiction is that when one reads the works of critical theories of education, as far back as Socrates, going on to John Dewey, to Paulo Freire, to Michael Apple, there's an unambiguous assertion of the need for education to be a process of renewal, questioning, creative visioning, and transformation. This perspective went mainstream when it was adopted by UNESCO when it promulgated the five pillars of education. These pillars are learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together, learning to be and learning to transform oneself and society. The discussion on education transformation at UNESCO started in earnest as far back as 1972. And the pillars of learning was the distillation of the fundamental changes needed if education was to fulfill its purpose. And incidentally, Michael Manley of Jamaica was one of the members of the commission who wrote the, the seminal report that expose the pillars. Sometimes to get to the future, you must revisit the past. And I would like to briefly examine the essence of these pillars because you will note that they are even more relevant now than ever. It will also substantiate my point about education being change resistant. How could we have had such a poignant indicator of the elemental functions of education and yet not enable its actualization in developing our education systems. Few educators I know in the Caribbean have taken these five pillars to heart. So when we look at learning to know, for example, and I draw your attention to the chart, what is involved here is respect, you know, it's developing the knowledge, skills, and values to respect the search for knowledge and wisdom. And that involves lifelong inculcating lifelong education, critical thinking, and understanding of the world. Learning to be involves self-definition because a lot of us really don't truly know who we are as Caribbean people. Self-identity, self-knowledge, self-actualization, autonomy, judgment, self-respectability. Learning to live together is about tolerance, respect for difference, and importantly in our times, managing tension, exclusion, conflict, and violence. Learning to do is about active engagement in, the, in productive employment and recreation. So acquiring technical and professional training, learning to apply knowledge are all critical elements of that. And learning to transform oneself and society is about transforming attitudes and lifestyles. And again, you know, we just look at life on a daily basis in our societies and we can see the importance of that. Living sustainable lifestyles, environmental and ecological respect, upholding democracy, and acting for social solidarity. The core of our contemporary problem is that we have tinkered with education 
in an era that requires nothing less than its transformation. And while we have been tinkering, others have been innovating and leaving us less globally competitive and further behind. I don't intend to delve into some technical analysis that you would have already heard as a repetitive mantra of the deficits of Caribbean education. I want to keep it real with some straight talk about basic things that create the deficits and how these contribute to and compound the persistent challenges that bedevil us. So what are some of the key things that contribute, that contribute to the deficits that we see? The first is the early childhood education gap. Early childhood is the big gaping hole in the system and the clearest indicator of the persistence of the colonial legacy in education. If you examine the history and the evolution of education in the region, you will note that in the post-emancipation period, the main emphasis was on rudimentary education at a very basic primary level. Functional literacy was the requirement for functioning in the post-slave economy. Mass education and early childhood development beyond the inculcation of Christian values was not a concern. In, the, in this current period, 2017-18, on average, only 24% of the children ages 0 to 2 years access early childhood education in the OECS, while for the three to four year cohort, 68.1% enjoy access. In the specific case of Grenada, the zero to two year access is 5.1% with greater access for girls, and the three to four year cohort access is 89.5%, the highest in the OECS. In the past decade, a great deal of research has been done by Ivy League universities on early childhood development and brain development that shows conclusively that the most important formative stage in the development of the human person is the zero to five, and in particular, the zero to three age band. It's actually called the critical period hypothesis. It has been demonstrated that the stimulation that occurs at this stage establishes the cognitive potential for life. And it is for this reason that if we are serious about human development in the region, we must make early childhood development a priority. As a former permanent secretary in education in both Grenada and St. Lucia, I am acutely aware of the comp competing priorities for resource allocation in that sector but I am also painfully conscious of the areas of wastage in our education systems. Waste, wastage which, if eliminated, could allow for much more productive reallocation. Our challenge is not money, but imagination. There are ways of increasing access to high quality early childhood education and development that do not require massive capital expenditure constructing early childhood centers island-wide. We have, for example, the roving caregivers model, which is a Jamaican, Caribbean Jamaican innovation that has received worldwide recognition as a high quality, cost-effective modality that engages home caregivers for continuity of stimulation. Many of our current ECD centers have fallen victim to the undesirable wave of learning competition that is sweeping our systems. So even at the early childhood level, instead of focusing on play, stimulation, and discovery for cognitive and psychomotor development. The second area is what I call the fetish with testing. In the Caribbean, we have subverted the intent of testing from an instrument for measuring progress to a competitive end in itself. Throughout our systems, testing is used to control access where spaces are limited. But even when access is available, it is still used to manage prestige and to maintain stratification using competitive ranking as its justification. 
One expensive Jamaican preschool a few years ago began issuing entrance exams to pre-kindergarten applicants, undoubtedly a device for managing the high demand for places and to ensure that they obtain students of a high standard. Now, I must make the distinction between exams at that early stage as a determinant of access and the difference between that and an assessment of a child to determine whether that child has learning def deficits or gifted qualities and therefore requires some special attention. These are two distinct and different forms of testing. I should also point out that our, at our recent Ministers of Education meeting held uh, about a month ago in St. Kitts and Nevis, OECS Ministers of Education that is, um, Minister Emlyn Pierre of Grenada raised this issue as a deep concern that she held and there was substantial discussion among the ministers on that question. Um, it is a view that I totally subscribe to that we have to properly determine what is the place of testing in our systems and not treat tests as competition among students. The point that we need to, the point about it is that we need to spend less time on testing and more time on learning at all levels, but especially at elementary levels. From a policy perspective, the preoccupation with testing arises because we've seen the deficiencies, but are not applying, but are applying the wrong solutions to the problem. So where we see problems, we give more testing, rather than do more teaching to encourage more learning. If students are not learning, the answer is not to test more, but to teach better. In my earlier career, I was also guilty of this misconception. Having discovered that the, as PS Education in St. Lucia that the common entrance exam exposed the fact that an average of 15% of the candidates every year were functionally illiterate. So how could you spend five, six years in primary school and when you sit in the terminal exam to move on to secondary school, that's when we discover you functionally illiterate? I mean, think of the wastage of resources when I talk about the wastage in education. So we designed a minimum standards test to be applied at specified levels, intervals of the primary and secondary system in the expectation that we could catch these deficiencies early and remediation could be, could be ad addressed. A good intention that was immediately undermined when we, in a naive intent of transparency, publicly release all of the results for all schools. This unleashed a vigorous level of competition, competitive analysis within and between schools that in the space of two years reached ridiculous lengths, such as schools holding minimum standards award ceremonies, teachers offering MST extra lessons, and an entire industry of mock minimum standard practice exams. The moral of that story, and I want to quote an expert called, Mad, experts called Madison Lee, 2012. The moral of that story is that, well in, and I quote, well-intentioned testing programs have often produced unintended negative consequences that have impacted heavily on schools and on certain children and their families. The third point is that learning is not a competition. At a theoretical level, we all know that individuals learn at different rates, in different ways, and have different competencies. But for many of us, our intellectual knowledge of that fact does not coincide with our emotional apprehension of the reality when it comes to our children. The first question many parents ask when the test results or the end of term report comes in is not how good were your scores, but how did you rank? This is a dangerous practice because competitive criteria is not, and I repeat, is not the real measure of learning. Allow me to specifically explain this to the parents in the audience. 
And that was part of the, the related discussion with Minister Pierre in Antigua. There are two distinct ways of evaluating student performance. A test can either be criterion reference or norm reference. So, criterion reference tests measure performance against a fixed set of predetermined criteria or learning standards. Thus, every student gets the score that they deserve for the responses presented in the exam. Norm reference tests, on the other hand, are designed to measure students on a distribution curve that accentuates the performance differences among candidates in relation to poor, average, and exceptional performers. Put crudely, a norm reference test compares performance competitively and not in relation to the individual's mastery of the learning standards that they are expected to achieve. It's like a, like a sprint race. It is not how fast you are running, but how fast the entire race is being run. Learning is not a competition. A child may sit the same exam twice and on the second round achieve a dramatic increase in scores from say 40% to 60%. But if the performance of the group sitting that exam, the second round is much higher, then the student can actually be assessed as performing weaker. Our preoccupation with ranking makes the use of any test, whether criterion or norm re reference, a discouragement to improvement, and the use of test results for placement reinforces stratification in education and ultimately in society. And this was recognized, sorry. Okay, I missed out something here. Yeah. This was recognized with, by ECLAC in 2011 uh, in a publication they spoke about, they said that the region has failed to transform the education system, and the region meaning the Caribbean, into a powerful mechanism for equalizing opportunities, partially because a deciding factor in educational achievement and results is found in the environment and available income in the home. Advances made during the past decades in terms of coverage, access, and progression in the different cycles of education have brought about a stratification of learning outcomes and achievements in education systems. This inequality is also usually reflected in a clear segmentation and stratification of the quality and efficiency of the education provision system itself. Put simply, this has deep implications. You stratify according to exam results. The best schools get the best resources. Parents want to insist that the best children go to the best schools. So what do we expect to be the outcome? Incidentally, for those who, enter, who still may, may entertain doubts about the value of the CXE exams, you should know that CXE, all CXE exams are criterion reference as distinct from Cambridge whose exams are non-reference. The fourth area is the pedagogy of the classroom. Another determining factor impacting learning at school is the pedagogy of the school. How things are taught can make a major difference in whether they are learned. The how must take into account the scientific fact that there are seven different learning styles. And, and there are seven, seven different learning styles and we need to cater for, for learners with these differentiated needs. A quick review of these learning styles will demonstrate why, why students' ability to learn well in school, as Power is calling upon them to do, is impacted by their learning style and the extent to which the teacher takes that into account. So the seven styles are the visual, the oral, the verbal, the physical, the logical, the social, and the solitary. Children with a visual style or spatial style, 
their preference is the use of pictures, images, spatial stuff. So learning is best facilitated using visual media, pictures, mind maps. For an oral style is the use of music and sound, so recordings, rhyme and rhythm play an important role in that. Many of us would have learned in kindergarten a lot of the fundamentals through rhyme, rhyme and re rhythm, if you recall. The verbal linguistic style is really about the use of words both in speech and writing. So that's where the traditional chalk and talk. Some students can relate to the chalk and talk. But if you dramatize the lectures, it has a greater impact. Those who have a physical learning style or kinesthetic learning style, you have to use body, touch, hands, a sense of touch. So use of physical objects in learning, touching, movement, doing things. Uh, or as the old people say, a practical approach to things is their preferred way of learning. The logical and mathematical mindset uses logic, reasoning, system. They have a systems perspective. So in the case of a child like that, it really requires a lot of argumentation, reasoning, procedures. I mean, I'm not talking about highfalutin argumentation. Just the, that type of child will ask you questions. So for every answer you give, there'll be another why question coming, but that's their style of learning. For the social, the use of groups and teams, some kids work better when they are challenged by their peers, group thinking, um, group work, teamwork, role playing. And the solitary, those kids who will just work by themselves, no bother, no interruption, just quietly, their preferred uh, thing would be research projects, solitary assignments, and so on. So teaching well in order to enable students, enable learning well, first requires a reasonable knowledge of one's students, and secondly, a capacity to cater to those differentiated needs. It can no longer be chalk and talk, especially with today's kids being digital natives. The digitization of life has altered attention spans. In fact, Facebook's latest research shows that the attention span now, if you browse in on social media, is under three minutes. So you, you literally have three minutes if you want your posts to be effective to capture the digital native's attention. Um, so that has altered attention spans. It has altered modalities of reading and interaction with information. The different pedagogy is characterized by a different relationship between teaching, learning, and assessment. And I'll come back to that because that speaks to what I said earlier about the need for us to stop tinkering with educational change and do a systemic transformation of education. Because we cannot separate teaching in one bucket, learning in a separate bucket, and assessment in a different one. The key principles of that new different pedagogy involves a, a process of discovery, excitement, making concepts more practical. Secondly, students taking more responsibility for their learning, so peer support, student-led le learning, presentations, etc. And group work, research, project execution, and lastly, continuous feedback and iterative efforts to improve learning outcomes. And because I'm here in Grenada, and um, I think one has to pay tribute to both the current and past governments, and Minister Bernadine, the CPE, that exam that replaced your common entrance, in fact brings those three elements, teaching, learning, and assessment, in the correct nexus. And I think Grenada is seeing the benefits of that now in the performance of your students at, um, at the exit point for primary. The, the fifth area is the issue of parental involvement in education. We have moved from an Africanist perspective that it takes a village to raise a child to, at best, a substitutionist, substitutionist view that it is the responsibility of the school to raise my child or at worst, a hands-off posture in which the child raises itself. As a teacher's friend said to me just last week, some parents are making their children unlikable, 
right? Some straight talk, so let's face it. Some parents are making their children unlikable. They exercise no discipline over their children. They never support efforts by the school to instill discipline. They turn a blind eye to their children's shortcomings and they blame teachers for everything. Now I'll tell you a biographical story. When I passed to go to St. Mary's College in St. Lucia, which was a so-called elite secondary school, my dad dropped me at school and he said, there's one thing I want you to understand clearly. Any day you are sent to the principal's office for, for disciplining, when you reach home, multiply the licks by 10. <laughs> All right? So at the first time I was sent, ordered to go to the principal's office, I knelt before the teacher in the classroom, crying and pleading not to send me to the principal's office. So I had a reputation then for being a coward because people thought I was afraid of the principal. No, I was afraid of the licks coming at home. And um, the reality is that nowadays we have a total reversal of that situation. I was told by a teacher of a parent coming in and threatening in the presence of his child to shoot a, a teacher, and not name the countries, not in Grenada, <laughs> um, to shoot a teacher because the teacher disciplined the child because the child had been kicking the teacher. So, you may note that in the five factors I mentioned, many of these contributing factors are not purely technical, but they are psychosocial. They are having to do with social and cultural perceptions of education and how it defines the individual, how it ascribes social capital and influences social stratification. The recognition of that reality is important in shaping education policy because as the saying goes, culture eats strategy for lunch. So you can have the best laid education strategy if these five elements, as I described them earlier, are allowed to, to run unmitigated, any attempt at transformation will fail unless it takes account of these pervasive tendencies. It is therefore helpful for Sparrow to urge our children to go to school and learn well, otherwise they will, later on in life, they will catch real hell. But from our discussions tonight, you would have deduced by now that there's much that needs to be done to make the school right. Because when Sparrow urged them to go to school, he's assuming otherwise they'll catch hell. He's assuming that all is well with the school. The expectation that our schools are fit for purpose and able to guarantee the future that we aspire to will not be met unless we undertake a comprehensive transformation of the school. This process will necessarily involve significant introspective transformation as we too need to align our behaviors and our assumptions to the imperatives of our ambition. For our children to go to school and learn well, our educational ecosystem must be integrally transformed. We have tinkered in the past by fixing parts of the system in isolated silos. The experience of these failures tell us that any change in one component of the education ecosystem requires corresponding changes to the rest of the system so that there's convergence of purpose. If you change the curriculum, but don't change how it is being delivered, that is the pedagogy. If you don't provide training or facilitate engagement of teachers to teach it effectively or provide the needed equipment, then our efforts remain cosmetic. An ecosystem approach requires two vital elements. One, effective partnership, and two, four converged points of critical intervention. The partnership must involve parents, teachers, inclusive of the teachers' union, the ministry, and the denominational authorities. The focus of that partnership must be on the school as the locus of the action. The four converged points of action, points of critical intervention by the partnership, are the Ministry of Education, 
which needs to position itself as a service and not a command center. Too many ministries, too many ministries in the region. Now, I heard a loud clap, but that doesn't mean when I say that, that the ministry have no role to issue commands because sometimes manners are necessary, right? <laughs> too many ministries in the region and indeed the world see themselves as command centers issuing edicts to schools without listening to the issues, the concerns, and the recommendations emanating from their frontline soldiers, the teachers. This institutional hubris is the fundamental cause of policy dysfunction in the system. Now, repositioned as a service center, the Ministry of Education's approach to policy formulation and resource allocation will be more collegial, more participatory, and will be enriched by the infusion of perspectives from the trenches of learning. All of this may sound complicated and theoretical, but I can assure you it is not. It only takes a little humility and a lot of common sense to listen to the voices of stakeholders to understand, to listen to the voices of stakeholders to understand rather than listen to respond. And on the matter of policy formulation, there is one simple litmus test that can be applied. If you consider any policy, especially if you are in the ministry at a high level, any policy that you make, if it cannot be applied to your child, it is not good for anybody else's child. The school, the second area of intervention is the school. And the school now, for us to treat the school as a center of focus of the education system because this is where the rubber hits the road. Given the kaleidoscope of issues that our contemporary schools must address, they require the concerted attention and the unwavering support of what I call the sector village. Remember the Africans say it takes a village to raise a child. So the sector village is the ministry, its parents, its community, its all stakeholders, the denominational authorities. The notion of learning well, referenced by Sparrow in his Calypso, has broadened considerably from when he penned this song. There is much that we need to debate about the parameters of curriculum reform and its, and, and its intersection with redefining pedagogy, because curriculum and pedagogy are two sides of the coin of instruction and learning. A new curriculum must remove the false dichotomy between the two domains of the so-called academic and the technical and vocational. Now, let me spend a little time on this because one of the things that I hear most of phrases most often used, sadly, by educators themselves, and that's why I said earlier that People in education are the hardest minds to change. People have, uh, even educators sometimes say, these children are not academically minded. There is no such thing as a child who is not academically minded. The problem is, are we able to teach that child? Right? Are we able to reach that child? And also the notion of, you know, it's a false dichotomy. A, a new curriculum must remove that dichotomy between these two domains because from the, if you look at the diagram I have there, the, both the so-called academic and the technical and vocational share three domains. There is the cognitive, which is about knowledge, the acquisition of learning, book stuff, and so on. There is the affective domain, which is attitudes and so on, and the psychomotor, which is the skill dimension. Now, because of the nature of some of the subjects, you'd recognize that in the realm of the academic, several of the academic subjects will have a greater comp cognitive component, but all subjects share the same affective slice, the same share of the affective domain because they must inculcate attitudes, certain attitudes like critical thinking and so on. And then the psychomotor, obviously, in terms of the, the, um, the skills dimension, will be stronger 
in the case of technical subjects. Now, if we see that as, a, as, a, as an integrated picture, then our whole approach to subjects and so on is very different, becomes very different. As a matter of fact, just last year in, um, in, in Finland, they abolished subjects as we know them. Students approach teachers and, and students approach the question of learning through projects, through interactive stuff, through visits in nature, very hands-on learning, but bringing together all of these elements. Now, we don't have to, we have a tendency also to imitate, you know, best practices from abroad. And I keep telling people, even if you follow Singapore or Finland and do everything that they do by the book without skipping a beat, we're not going to get the same results because the people who succeed are those who have analyzed their situation very deeply, have turned the problems inside out and upside down, and have found solutions in their own soil. And so that we can learn from these experiences, but imitating them will not, will not help us. So they take, for example, in, in our approach may not be to abolish subjects, but even within our existing systems, there are radical changes that we can make that are not complicated. So for example, you take something like the teaching of French or a foreign language, which is seen as such an academic thing. We can practicalize that in very exciting ways for students. And by the way, I've been, I was asked once in one, sent, in one phrase, what you think is the most important thing that needs to be done in education? And my response was, make learning fun. If we do that, all our problems are solved. So how do we make learning fun? Teaching of a foreign language, say French, for example, you can have a French week in school where all subjects are taught in French that week. So not only are you going through the boring grammar and drill thing in a French class, but suddenly French becomes the language of instruction across the entire school. Now, if you're doing um, home economics, then French cuisine is what should be on the, on the agenda for that week, learning French um, dishes and cooking French dishes. I think you're French, eh, Father? No? Polish. Oh, Polish. I thought your accent was French. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, we do that. Um, in every, in every other subject, the use of French comes in. In chemistry, the, the, the French equivalents of the chemicals, the experiments, everything is done in French. Um, in literature, we look at French, read French literature. So there are ways of you know, bridging, bridging that, domain, that domain gap. Now, the additional thing is that our schools need to address the rapid transmutation of knowledge that is occurring today. And that's the other reason why we need to break those silos between subjects and we need to, to treat this as an integrated um, concept. Because now you have issues like climate change science, artificial intelligence, robotics, the internet of things, and you name it. There are so many things happening now. And the critical thing about that, particularly for those at secondary school level and at university level, is that the old notions of occupations are rapidly evolving. So you have new occupations emerging that actually represent a fusion of ideas that hitherto were inconceivable. There's a, you all have heard of the TED Talks. You can Google it. But I urge you to view a TED Talk by a guy called Matt Ridley from Oxford University. The students here will find it exciting because the title is what happens when ideas have sex, right? Because what Matt Ridley is showing is that just as in the natural world, the mating of species have genetic implications that sometimes create a fusion of genes to create something different. So maybe somebody with a green eye and a blue eyes may produce a child with green eyes. Um, you have that mating of ideas happening as well. And the mating of ideas results in something that never existed before. And he gives, sev he gives several examples of that. So 
You have now, for example, there was the case of a, uh, an architect who had these concepts of shapes and so on in buildings that were good on paper but impractical in construction because the materials, the, the, the designs that he produced defied the types of materials that were available. What did he do? He teamed up with a, a biologist who studied things like butterfly wings. And they teamed up with a material scientist. And between the three of them, they were able to come with new um, metallic, new, new synthesized products that had the strength of the butterfly wing, which by the way is not as fragile as we think it is. A butterfly can actually fly across the Atlantic Ocean, believe it or not. So they, uh, they came up with these fusions and out of that were a whole new set of possibilities for architectural designs that also became more earthquake resistant, more resilient to the environment, etc. So the long and short of this is that um, we also, at, while ad ad addressing those things, we need to, all problems still need to be addressed, but by new methods. So aside from the internet, artificial intelligence, all of this stuff, there are old problems that still need to be addressed. And look what we face in non-communicable diseases, infectious diseases, litter and pollution, environmental sustainability, food security. These two need to be addressed by innovative solutions. In short, therefore, the challenge when we talk about the school as a center of focus of the system, the challenge is to transform our schools so that they are health-promoting institutions. At the same time, they are incubators of innovation and applied technology. They are spaces in which tolerance, democratic practice, respect for diversity and civic responsibility flourish. And again, sometimes we need to go back to the past to find the solutions for the future. When I went to primary school in St. Lucia a long time ago, a lot of things happened that no longer happen in school. The Ministry of Health would come to the school once or twice a year. All inoculations were done. Um, some of the middle class kids, their parents had already had them inoculated. You still had to produce your certificate in, of inoculation, but every child was inoculated in school. There were dental visits once a year to at least do some basic checks and give advice. We were taught safety, basic safety, crossing the road, look up, look down, look up again, and there were rhymes and songs and everything. We, would, we had to clean our classroom at the end of every day. What happens now? Children litter their classrooms with impunity and believe it's the responsibility of the janitor to clean it. And some parents would object to the ministry saying that children must clean their classrooms at the end of the day because I'm not paying my taxes for my child to clean the classroom. But who's dirty in the classroom? Your child. Is your child cleaning their bedroom at home? Probably not if you take that position. So when, and you know, the use of things like student councils, giving students responsibility so that they learn responsibility is critical. The third area of intervention is the, um, is the community, which must be another area of intervention because a school as a center of knowledge production and human development must ground itself in the community. Whether it is a primary or secondary school, every school in our Caribbean should by night be an adult education center, as happened here in Grenada with the Centers for Popular Education. Every school should also be a community center, a cultural and social space that is conducive to strengthening the bonds of community. But conversely, the community itself should serve as a real world laboratory for converting knowledge into solutions. So if there's a problem of litter in Tivoli, and no prejudice against Tivoli, it's just a Grenadian village that came to mind. If there's a litter problem in Tivoli, why can't the, school in, the schools in Tivoli lead the charge in a campaign to end littering in the community? Um, it, this, the community can also be a location for utilizing learning to build 
civilization values. So the schools can lead a campaign for a month of good manners and the school children themselves go out and greet people in the community, have neighbors relate to neighbors. I mean, we, our, we are only limited people by our imagination, right? Forget just the textbook approach to learning. Life is learning. Um, so the, the fourth area of intervention is the economy. And that is critical and that's a huge thing, but it's important because our challenge as small island developing states is to find niche sustainable economic op opportunity through which we can earn our living in an unsentimental and brutally competitive global marketplace. You notice every time us small islands find something that we can latch onto to make money, the big boys come and try to close it down. Look at the Citizenship by Investment program, right? I can tell you without any fear of contradiction that had it not been for the CIP program in Dominica, Dominica would still be in the stone ages from the blows of Uma and Maria. All of the money that was promised or most of the money that was promised to Dominica after the hurricane has, is, has yet to materialize. In the meantime, the government used these resources to reconstruct entire villages. You go on the internet and, and research it to see the quality of the infrastructure, support from countries like China, what has been done to help Dominica recover and stand on its feet. But yet, the OECD and the European countries are busy trying to shut it down. So, in so far as the school is concerned, its contribution to this responsibility is to produce citizens who, while rooted in their identity, are global in their outlook and competitive in their competence. I wish to end by quoting a document that was purportedly posted on the door of a university in South Africa whose message summarizes why learning is so critical in our individual lives and in the regeneration of the nation. It reads, destroying any nation does not require the use of atomic bombs or long-range missiles. It only requires lowering the quality of education and allowing cheating in the exams by students. Patients die at the hands of such doctors. Buildings collapse at the hands of such engineers. Money is lost in the hands of such economists and accountants. Humanity dies at the hands of such religious scholars. Justice is lost at the hands of such judges. The collapse of education is the collapse of the nation. And so parents, I leave you with this consideration. It is not what you do for your children, but what you've taught them to do for themselves that will make them successful human beings. And for the students, go to school and learn well. Otherwise, later on in life, you will catch real hell. All, all of us will catch real hell. Without education, our, our whole life will be misery and we're better off dead. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, Dr. Tedeka Struz. Can we give him another, another round of applause, please? As a university, we seek to present a fully framed picture of the challenges with education in the Caribbean and the implication of some of these challenges based on our local context, which is why we asked Deputy Commissioner of Police, Mr. Franklin Redhead, to make a presentation here today. Deputy Commissioner Redhead has been a senior manage in senior management for over 15 years. He has been Deputy Commissioner for the past 11 years and is responsible for strategic oversight of administration, which encompasses 
professional standards and discipline regime, human resource, ICT, finance, community relation departments, and audit, audit portfolios. Deputy Commissioner Reddit graduated from the United States Coast Guard Officer Candidate Program in 1987, and he was subsequently undergone, he has subsequently undergone several other training stints in the USA and UK. He also served a two-year segment at the Regional Security System Central Liaison Office in Barbados as the office staff officer, maritime operation, and later as administrator, chief instructor at the regional security system training unit in Antigua. He's also an adjunct lecturer at the TA Marshall Community College, a member of the board of directors, aviation services of Grenada, and chairman of the Grenada Gaming Commission. His academic achievements include two master's degree, an MBA from University of Wales, UK, and a master's degree in defense studies from the University of London, United Kingdom. Please join me in welcoming Deputy Commissioner of Police, Mr. Franklin Redhead. Uh, thank you, and good evening to our distinguished visitors and guests. I permit me to stand on the protocol already established because if I go through the protocol list, that will be half my speech. <laughs> um, but certainly I was invited to offer uh, sentiments relative to the possible nexus between juvenile delinquency and education or the lack thereof. And certainly it's an honor to be here as part of this evening's um, lecture series. Juvenile delinquency, by way of definition, uh, can be described as the habitual committing of criminal acts or offenses by a young person, especially one below the age of which ordinary criminal prosecution is possible. While there are many factors that influence juvenile delinquency, there is a general consensus that education or lack thereof, taken in its broadest definition, is a contributing factor. A good place to begin in unpacking this discussion is in the evidence and data. And while I profess not to be an expert on this subject, my experiences and extant realities will have shaped my opinions on this matter. It is indeed a complex issue, and certainly the parameters of this evening's discourse does not permit a more rigorous interrogation of this important topic. Further, there isn't always a linear progression or relationship between lack of education and juvenile delinquency. A former education secretary within the United States noted that functional illiteracy correlates highly to crime rates. And he argued for increased spending for literacy programs as a key pillar in countering this perceived societal threat. Many studies and commentators have different views on the causal relationship between education and crime, and in certain contexts, juvenile delinquency. However, it is widely accepted observation that education lowers crime, and this constitutes a public good. In examining our local realities, I would refer extensively to the work of Dr. Crawford Daniel, and of course, national crime statistics. Firstly, in a study conducted by Dr. Crawford Daniel that captured data over a finite ten-year period, one can infer some poignant trends. Among the male offenders, approximately 40% did not complete secondary education. Of the approximately 60% who did, only 27% achieved the level of Form 4. And this is similar for female offenders. Of the combined list of offenders, only one had completed some level of tertiary education, TAMCC. And we are speaking here of a grouping of approximately 1,000 offenders. 
Though the majority of juvenile offenders indicated that they did not complete secondary education, approximately 52% did not provide a reason for the incompletion. However, those who did give a reason said that they dropped out of school to find a job, and the irony here is that finishing one's education is what will put you in a position to earn a very good job or a position. A smaller percentage, around 10%, said it was because they could not cope with the traditional schoolwork. And this is an aspect that must be revisited in the context of providing diverse opportunities, being cognizant that persons have different types of competencies and leanings. A bit about juvenile sex offenders and educational attainment. In the same case study, of course, our national statistics is closely aligned to the findings in Dr. Crawford's research. In the same case study, there were 14 sex crimes for which male offenders were incarcerated. And of course, the specific crime included rape, attempted rape, carnal kind of knowledge, indecent assault. And of course, the offenders range in age from 15 to 18 and attended both primary schools and secondary schools. It's important to note, however, that the incarcerated sex offenders have only attained grades 7 and 8 at primary school and highest level at form 2 in secondary schools. I mean, one can infer many things from this statistic, and of course I will leave that up to you and your imagination to ponder. Data from other jurisdictions show similar trends. For example, in India and other jurisdictions, significantly 40% of the persons who are convicted juveniles or juvenile offenders um, have only up to a primary level education. Um, in some cases, a significant percentage were illiterate, and a further percentage uh, were, edu were, were educated to some level of secondary education. So this is the bad news. Um, I was only given five minutes, so... <laughs> I want to turn the discussion, however, in, in another direction and focus on the utility of education in suppressing juvenile delinquency and reformation. And certainly focus on prison reformation at our own penal system in Grenada, and particularly through project research, which involves a diverse range of topics and skills in the quest to reform juvenile offenders and to reduce the level of recidivism. That's a word that gave me a lot of problem. I think some mouths were not made to pronounce certain words, and this was one of them, okay? <laughs> the rate of recidivism in the general prison population is about 60%. Contrast this with the rate of recidivism with persons who have gone through the program and have attained CVQs and NVQs, recidivism rate is 5%, a significant drop in recidivism because of education um, in that regard. And if ever there was an advert for education, I would suggest that this would be quite fitting. Uh, the benefits of education are manifold, and certainly Dr. Jules have uh, ventilated most of those in, in, in his discourse. Um, from, from the point of view of personal benefit, from the point of view of, of the benefits to society and communities, and certainly societies with higher rates of degree completion and levels of education tend to be held here have healthier rates of economic stability, lower crime rates, greater economic, greater equality for most parts. So education we know improves critical thinking, greater sense of discipline, it promotes equality and empowerment, promotes good citizenship and civic involvement. Those with education or higher education tend to be more aware of current political issues and are more likely to vote. And of course, higher degree holders are twice as likely to volunteer and have a sense of community. It also reduces crime. Education teaches people the difference between right and wrong and also exposes children and young adults to, experience, to the experiences of others. Understanding right and wrong and having empathy reduces tendency to commit crimes. Education of society decreases overall arrests and some studies suggest that just over one year increase of average education levels of a country decreases nationwide arrest by as much as 11%. So to conclude, approximately 55% of crimes occurring in Grenada are of a violent nature or contain elements of violent conduct. 
This is not a challenge that is unique to Grenada. It is a pan-Caribbean challenge. Uh, the World Bank estimates that the Caribbean, if you define the Caribbean as island states, or if you include the Rimland states, or if you even segment it further into Francophone or Anglophone, the Caribbean, in its broadest definition, accounts for 6% of the world's population, but is responsible for 27% of the world's murders and crimes. Uh, this is not a very flattering statistic. Um, these challenges have the potential to threaten the stability and governance of states, and more often than not, these crimes are executed by juvenile offenders where the gang and organized criminal culture has taken root. Education and enlightenment, while not a panacea, because there are many factors which contribute to juvenile delinqu delinquency, is a critical aspect of how we can all work together to suppress a threat that juvenile delinquency and crime poses to our society. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner, Mr. Franklin Redhead. We now have an opportunity to ask some questions, if you have. We have 20 minutes allotted for this section. We have a mic in the middle. If you have a question, yes, if you have a question, you're going to go to the mic and ask your question to our presenters. Yeah, good evening, uh, Madam Chairperson. Um, I'd just like to make a comment before I pose a question. And I'd just like to make a request also. I would like, I did not get the opportunity to listen to Dr. Jules. Because while he spoke, I was tossing him in my mind. So I would like a copy of this evening's presentation so that I can listen to him in my spare time. That's one. Number two, um, education has been tinkered over the years, and the question is, why? And what is the purpose of education in the Caribbean? Coming out of colonialism and um, being part of the geopolitical struggles between the East and the West and the communists and the capitalists, what really is the purpose of education in the Caribbean? Well, we're no longer in the age of the old war, so the Cold War, sorry. But um, in every society, regardless of its ideological complexion, the role of education is, is a socializing function. It is for the transmission of knowledge and the socialization of people. So socialization according to what are the norms of your society, even in so-called primitive societies, although they may not have been schools at the time, there was a process of education that help people to learn the norms of the society and fit in. So in that sense, I would say very broadly, education has a universal function, and that is the transmission of knowledge and the, the, the evolution of civilization. Um, in the case of the Caribbean, we have to decide for ourselves what really that means in practical terms. Now again, I was part of the group that developed the CARICOM 2030 education strategy. And what we did was to start by adopting, people don't believe in philosophy, but you really have to start from a philosophical base for everything. Otherwise, you're just a, a reed blowing in the wind. We started with the statement of the ideal Caribbean person. Because that statement developed by CARICOM says that the ideal Caribbean person is somebody who loves life, who's gender sensitive, environmentally conscious, historically aware, 
culturally active, a number of things. Taken as a whole, it really represents, well, as the name says, the ideal Caribbean person. But whose responsibility it is to produce that ideal Caribbean person? So we adopted that as the philosophical position for what education in the Caribbean is to achieve. Now, if you think about it, each one of those elements of the ideal Caribbean person translates in very practical terms to what should happen in schools. If we're talking about somebody who's gender sensitive, it means in the school, we have to practice gender sensitivity. We have to teach gender sensitivity. And we don't teach gender sensitivity by getting children to read in a book about gender. You do it in simple ways that home econ if a school is teaching home economics, then they should determine boys as well as girls do home economics. If you're doing um, carpentry or woodwork, boys as well as girls do it. Um, you do it also by teaching the boys to respect the girls in the school. Um, so, as I said, there are a lot there. We only limited by our imagination in terms of how we translate these ideals into practical reality. For the first comments, the lecture is being streamed live um, on TNR Communications Facebook page, and the recording will be available. Okay. Yeah, good Ms. evening, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Jules, um, I'd like to put this plan, this idea. Schooling is not necessarily education. That's from my experience. But Dr. Jules, I have a question for you since 1981. <laughs> Why did you think that technical education is too expensive? August 1981. You told me that the reason for closing the technical center, Grenada Technical Center, was because technical education was too expensive. So why? And what is it? If you have a change of mind now, why? What caused it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's say, let's say people evolve. Um, <laughs> but, but the point, I honestly don't recall that conversation, but um, just thinking, no, 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 um, let me, I, I will respond to you, but, but I can think of reasons. Yeah, go ahead. It was done in the Ministry of Education building on Young Street in August of 1981. Yeah, I know where I was in August 81. <laughs> I'm simply saying I don't recall the conversation, but there, there, there could be a number of reasons why I would have said something like that. Um, because let me just indicate that um, we were not opposed in 81 to the idea of technical education. We simply felt that technical education is something that had to be done properly. And I recall that um, UNESCO had this project for create, um, creating centers for technical education in the, in the Eastern Caribbean. Well, several of the, the Windward Islands for sure. And I attended that meeting. It was funded by the Kuwaitis. The original project designed by UNESCO was to do a set of studies and consultancies about the condition of TVET in these islands. And Grenada was the only country which fought that project conception to see if we're going to spend that kind of money. It was about 20 million US at the time, which was huge money in those days. We needed instead to create centers that would be sort of like parish locations to which schools could go in order to do TVET. Um, I'll be very frank with you too. In the early part of my career, I had a serious issue with TVET because every time I attended a meeting where TVET teachers were present, they were arguing for what I call the TVETization of the education system. TVET teachers had, seemed to have a very strong perspective that they believe, okay, children not learning, so they should be taught to do things with their hands. And I had a fundamental problem with that because I believe, as I said, there's no such thing as a child who's not academically minded. It's how we teach them. And it's a question of balancing 
the learning that takes place. So we cannot just write off a child because they're having difficulty with language or, or, or mathematics and say, let's teach them to become carpenters. In 19, 19, no, 2000 and something, was it five or six, I attended the World Conference on Tibet Education in Shanghai, in China. And what I saw in that World Conference none of us here would recognize as being TVET because it was such high-tech stuff, right, that they were teaching in China as TVET. And the, the institutions that were developed to do that were on a different level altogether. And interestingly, to do, to do TVET in that environment, you had to have been, in my view, a top academic student. Because the, the types of stuff they were doing with, I mean, it wasn't, you see, our notion of TVET is very rudimentary. Teach people to build things like basic carpentry stuff, basic plumbing stuff. This is not where the world is going. I have a fridge at my home I bought in, in Miami. I mean, I look, it was, it was a reasonably cheap. I bought it for about 300 US, and it's, it's you know, well set up and everything. The fridge starts to go bad. I'm in trouble. Nobody in St. Lucia can repair the fridge. So then I read the manual, and it says if you have a problem, you dial this number, you put your cell phone, when you hear a beep from the number, you put your cell phone against the fridge, and then it will self-diagnose. No, I'm telling you, it's a $300 US dollar fridge. It will self-diagnose. Now the fridge started going bad, I dialed the number, but guess what? The number is not operational outside of the US. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so, so that could be part of the reason, you know. I mean, if we talk in TVET, let's be serious about TVET. And also, to my earlier point, let's get away with that false dichotomy between academic and technical and vocational. And, and I do agree, by the way, with the notion that um, schooling is not necessarily education. That's why I said earlier in my remarks that when Sparrow talk about the importance of going to school to learn well, otherwise you will catch hell, he's assuming that schools are working the way schools are supposed to work. But there's still a lot wrong with schools. And again, we keep sometimes applying the wrong solutions to the problem. I had a big argument with UNICEF when they came up with this notion of um, what is it, schools as um, child-friendly schools. They were financing this all over the Caribbean in the last 10 years. And I'm like, what, what do you mean by a, a school as a child-friendly institution? By its very nature, a school is supposed to be a child-friendly institution. So when you go and pre prepare a project like that, and then now schools have to apply for grants, there's a whole manual on how to become a child-friendly institution, you're completely missing the point. Because what we need to do is to refocus the school to do all the things that the school is ex supposed and expected to do, and not just focus on its child-friendliness. That's, that's the essence of the institutional character. Good, e good evening, everybody. Well, first of all, I want to congratulate both UWI and you, Dr. Jules for this evening. A lot of what you said, of course, I could have been speaking to the whole group myself because I share your views and a lot of what you said. One of the things I just want to mention is that when you mention about going back to the, going to the past sometimes to look for the future, I remember meeting a few older than me Caribbean people who were, I think a couple of them were doctors, but what impressed me, they had of course gone to, I should say, the best schools in the territories that they belong to, like Guyana and Jamaica. But what was interesting was that though they might have become doctors, they were equally comfortable and fluent in so many other areas. Mm -hmm. They could visit a, a theater and watch a play by Moliere. Me, student of French and I myself couldn't even do that. But it, it struck me that over the years we had diluted our education, or maybe it's not 
fair to say that. Maybe it's where the British invested more heavily in education. The leading schools really gave a real, very well-rounded education. Not perfect, but so we have a lot we can learn from that still. But really what I want you to comment on, I do not understand why after approximately 10 years of school, governments must still find it necessary to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on programs, quote unquote, preparing people for work. <laughs> what has school been for? The second point I would like you to comment on. What is the rationale for doing 13, 14, 15 subjects at O levels, CXC, whatever you want to call them, I have known young people who are doing extra lessons Monday to Friday, all day Saturday, Sunday, all day homework. So where is the time to learn to live with other people, one of the pillars that you mentioned? Where is the time to enjoy a game of football where we don't have matinee no more? But just living with friends. You know, something seems radically wrong with that approach, and it is reinforced by the fact that the awards that are given at the end of the fifth form year are based on the number of subjects that the student is. Okay, so on the school and preparation for the world of work, uh, I do agree with you. I mean, it is a fact that schools are supposed to prepare you for the world of work. In fact, when I went to school in St. Lucia, the motto at my primary school, the RC Boys Primary, was not for, sco not for school but for life. That was our motto. And I, I just de I described earlier some of the things that happened. There was health education. We learned to clean the classroom. A whole lot of stuff happened in that school. Um, unfortunately, this is how we have evolved in the Caribbean. Um, and so I think governments really do not, at this historical juncture, do not have a choice in spending the money that they have done in preparing students for the world of work because it is a deficiency. And if there's a deficiency of that character, you have to address it. However, it cannot be the final solution. It's just an interim plaster that you put on that So, The ultimate solution really is to transform the school, as I've argued, to make the school do what it is supposed to do. Um, I, I, I too have a bit of a problem with this because I recall when I was PS Education in St. Lucia, several things happened. One, um, the World Bank and these people would do surveys and they would say that, well, labor school surveys to see what is the adequate preparation for the world of work. And they would interview the private sector. Now, hear me out carefully on that, right? Because I don't have anything intrinsic against the private sector. But the reality is that the private sector in our societies is largely a distributive sector. Most people just import, mark up, sell. There, there is a very, the productive sector in our economy is very small and under severe strain. So if you do a survey asking employers what type of employers, what type of skills and competencies they require, we experience that in CXE too. I mean, what you get is a lot of soft skill stuff. So people say they need people with certain attitudes. But in terms of actual hard skills, you, can't get, you, you really can't get the answers. And even when they describe the hard skills, some of these skills are so low-tech that they, do not, they are not the kind of skills that you, are, that you would put time and energy and resources into forming somebody with to come out. Because by the time they complete, the world would have gone past that. Right? And in fact, some studies have shown that right now, in today's world, not thinking the Caribbean, but globally, if you're doing a four-year degree program, by the time you reach your third year, what you'd have learned in the first year is largely obsolete. Right? So, so in that context, we have a lot to do. Um, school has to be even more futuristic in its orientation. 
And we, we have all, and this, in saying that, I also want to caution, it's not about overburdening the curriculum because we have a tendency equally, whenever there's a problem in society, you hear people calling for a subject to be made out of that, right? As if that's the plaster for every soul. So we have a problem of AIDS, let's do AIDS education. Um, drug thing, let's do drug education. And when I was at CXC, I seriously resisted these things. And my argument back to them is that we don't need AIDS education and drug education and infectious disease education. So all we need is a subject that deals with wholesome lifestyles, right? Now, if we do that, then you learn not to say no. And we also have subjects whose potential is not being realized to deal with those things. So physical education and sport is not a subject you do behind a desk. It is being active in sports clubs in the school. It's being on the playing field. Some measure of book study to understand nutrition, but that ties into food and nutrition as a subject. So the existing subjects need to be used better, but in a, in a transdisciplinary way so that they reinforce each other and they are connected to life. So that's, that's my response to that. The other, the other part of the experience too was that I remember at the time the government of St. Lucia um, brought in some experts from abroad to discuss the creation of incubators for technology in the country. And when I met with the consultants, they had this plan to build these little factory locations. So in different districts, you'd have like a factory shell that was supposed to be an incubator where people could learn technology stuff. And I said to them, but this is a waste of government money. We already have an incubation system, and it's called the education system. So rather than create this artificial thing outside of education, treat every school as an incubator for IT. So by getting hands-on engagement in IT and so on in the schools, which would make it really exciting, talk about making learning fun for kids, that's where we're going to make the difference, not these artificial incubators. On the question of the subjects, um, this is a question of parental vanity and school hubris. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I'll tell you something, Guyana, Guyana, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago, but mostly Guyana, are noted for that. There's a school called Queen's College in Guyana. It has made it its reason for existence to show that it has the most students with 15 plus and 21 subjects and so on. But some interesting things about that. One, you would think, and every year CXC has these award ceremonies where we recognize the top performing students, but mind you, it's a fallacy. People believe it's the number of subjects you get. It's not, because with 10 subjects, you can still get a CXC top award. It depends on what your profile is, as distinct from having 21 subjects, but with a different profile. But I remember reading a criticism in the newspapers in Barbados. A guy was saying, why is CXC promoting this thing and giving these top awards for students? And there are other um, examples of, of exemplary performance in the system. I said, he's correct. So what we started doing, aside from just publishing who were the top students um, overall in the region, in Cape and CSEC, we also publish a list of the top students in every subject, right? And it was amazing to see that list because then the elite schools no longer featured. Because when you did it subject by subject, you would find, you know, like, um, is it St. Rose? I remember one year, there's a school in St. Patrick's. There's a St. Rose Secondary in, yeah, St. Rose Modern appeared in one of the in, in one of the, the subject headings, right? So you find schools that are not usually on the radar. If they have good students, these students shine, right? So we publish the top 50 students in the region in every subject. I believe CXC still does that. Now, one would think that the child who gets 21 subjects is a real nerd and abstracted from reality. When CXC does this top awards thing, it's usually at council time. 
So there's a portion of the CXC staff who are assigned to take care of them because that's like a big treat. They go to an, a different island and we bring them around, they go on tours, they have a lot of fun. These kids are the most fun-loving kids you ever met. I actually hung out with them twice during my time there, spent a whole day with them. And I asked them the question, but how are you all so regular and yet you all have all these subjects? Time management, that's, what, that's the secret that they mastered. Two secrets they mastered. Time management and they knew how to play the CXC system. <laughs> I'll tell you the secret to play in the CXC system. If you are a science student and you're doing in chemistry, physics, biology, for what you study on the syllabus for these three subjects, you can easily sit integrated science. So instead of passing three subjects, you pass four. Right? And you look at the subject configuration, there are a number of subjects like that where the, the knowledge crosses over. So if, you, if you're really good and sharp on it, for the price of one, you could get two. Right? <laughs> so that's, that's the bottom line. But, but let me say too, let me say too that um, it's not something I think we had a, a, a dilemma at CXE at the time over this thing because some people were calling for, for us to prevent students from doing that many subjects because there's clearly an increasing trend. But the thing is, I don't believe you should put limits on any possibility for any child. If you want to do 50 subjects, make my day, do your 50 subjects. But we need to be careful not to make that the new norm because then you create more of the stratification that I was warning about earlier. Okay. Greetings. And thanks for your intellectual lecture. However, the key point must be to bring all these ideal principles and realistic expectations into beneficial actions. Now, I am a dunce student. And, and can what? A dunce student. Uh, there's no such thing. Well, I am a dunce slow student. No, you're not. <laughs> you have bad teachers. And I can only... <laughs> I can only understand the subject being taught this evening to mean that the reasons for the challenges with education in the Caribbean is as a result of children that wanting to go to school and to learn. But I'm an ambitious student like Bill Trotman who always cries, Mommy, Mommy, I want to go back to school because I don't want to be a fool. I am also an analytical student and sufficiently radical to put all the major blames for the challenges with education in the Caribbean on the policy makers and the technical administrators and the business operators in the educational sector. In my education class here in Grenada, and I'll take the liberty to represent the grassroots, poor people, the supreme creator God and his biblical rules and religious services are not given high appreciation and reverence. A public library is of no importance, and having one is of the past, over the past two decades or so. As was said before, after obtaining 8, 10, 12, or even more sexy subjects, graduates are described as unemployable, not having soft skills, and don't have anything of the lack of critical thinking. CPEA, as you have raised tonight, here this evening, has placed tremendous stress on parents, teachers, and children. Shocking delinquents, deviants, dropouts, as well as mental and health issues, all associated with the academic programs prepared and delivered. The Mighty Sparrow must know 
that the new normal for most of us, even with a school certificate, is catching hell in social hands out like the Imanis. Definitely too, it must be said that apart from the, the tits, the global dictates of the United Nations, the real problems with our education is not largely due to foreign factors such as what is similar now with the coronavirus, but rather it is about the people like yourself, Dr. Jules, of the OECS and CARICOM officials and the business partners. I will end here by saying I welcome your presentation. I welcome also your confession that you have evolved. <laughs> and I also want to say here that let us not continue on this repeating, tinkering. It's time to put things to action. And, and I have been disappointed with you maybe about five or eight years ago when you gave a similar presentation in SGU how you responded to my comments in terms of, of education system and what have me disturbed I hope you can remember you, you, you may not that today children are reading most and I'm wondering if indeed reading forms the basic foundation and indicator for progress in education then why are we still disturbed about the challenges in education thank you very much mm. <laughs> well let me pick your last point first If you are incapable of changing your mind about anything, then you are not capable of thinking. Because I think one has to always question where you're coming from, and in light of the evidence available, be ready to reconsider and reconceptualize. Um, there are a lot of things that you've said here, but just sort of picking a number of things that you stimulated in my mind. Um, there's a concept called the organic intellectual. You don't have to have 10 degrees to be an intellectual. And that's why I said to the gentleman, when he said he described himself as a dumb student, the way he spoke, that can be the, the speech of a dumb student. So clearly, you yourself have evolved if from when you were in school. Um, but the point about being an, intel being an organic intellectual is that everybody has the capability to learn. Um, as you saw from the presentation, there are different styles of learning. So people learn in different ways. They, they, they develop in different ways. And I remember if you, if I, I don't know if these books are still around or available, but if you look at the CPE textbooks that were written during the time of the revolution, for the adult education program, you would find in one of the textbooks, we, well, several of them, the content was all local as much as possible. One of, the, one of the reading passages which I wrote myself was called Cunha the Inventor. Cunha was at the time a semi-literate worker on one of the government estates who found a way, designed a trap for the African beetle that was affecting the, the, the farms. A simple trap that he developed that was very effective using the wood of the African breadfruit because I think the sap attracted the beetles. So we decided to showcase Cunha and the man became a, almost virtually a national hero. And there was a man who was, you know, very basic in his education, but through the powers of observation and, he, you know, use of his own understanding of science, he found a way to, to create this thing which was beneficial to the, to the economy. So I think we, we have to be careful again about stereotyping people um, and determining, you know, on the basis of so-called academic performance, describe them and lock them into these paradigms. Um, the other thing is that I take objection to the statement that the CPA is creating stress. Uh, the CPA, by if you understand what the CPA is and how it works, it is not a stress-inducing approach. 
because rather than being a one-shot exam, it happens over two years. If there is stress, no, hear me out. If there are parents and the system is using the, 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 the program, this thing of segregating students, because the, the basic concept in CPA, as I said, is a different approach to teaching, learning, and assessment. And assessment is being used throughout the process to continually help students improve. So for example, in the teaching of English, how the CPA is supposed to work? A teacher would have a discussion with students about, okay, we want to discuss writing a good essay. What do your class think are the elements of a good essay? And we have a discussion on that. Fine, we agree on what these elements are. Let us choose a topic to write an essay on. Go write a three-page essay on that topic. After you've written it, every member of the class stands up and reads his or her essay to the rest of the class. So not only have you written, there's a reading back element to that. After you read it back, your peers, the rest of the class and the teacher give you critical feedback on the essay, how to, what they like, what they didn't like, how to improve it. And the teacher sends everybody back to rewrite the essay, taking into account the feedback that you've received, right? And the class goes through as many iterations of that until the teacher recognizes that they are satisfied. Now, obviously, children work at different rates. So by the second iteration, Nicole's essay, the teacher will say, Nicole, I'm happy with your essay. But Didicus still has to do his. I'm working on mine. They would assign Nicole to work with me. Nicole helped Didicus get his essay, you know, take account of the criticisms and improve his essay. What has been the result? Because this has been running for more than 10 years. Psychometrically, students are shown to learn faster from their peers than from the teacher. Now, you're not holding back the brighter students because Nicole is not sitting twiddling her thumbs while the rest of us are hustling to fix our essay. She's actually a sub-teacher helping us to improve. So the brighter students, by helping the slower students, are actually improving their brightness, while the, fast, the slower students are going, moving faster. And the first iteration of that essay goes into a portfolio, the middle iteration and the final product. And this is how the methodology works through the two years. So when you, what, what, was, what is the final exam? is only a portion of the marks. It's not like before, when you go into common entrance, you spend, what, three to six hours in, in one exam, do or die, racing against time, and your whole future is decided against that. You have two years of work that goes into that process of formative assessment that improves how you do things, developing the skills, showing, demonstrating that, and then that comes into play. Okay, this is our last question. Okay, good evening everybody, good evening. Um, my, my co it's really a comment, more than a question, or more than a question. If it's a, at all going to be a question, it's kind of rhetorical. We have had talks over and over, yearly, every year almost, on these sorts of issues. Since I've started teaching, I've been listening to all these discussions, and nothing has really changed in the ex education system. I am wondering, is it that hard for Caribbean educators to adapt to changes? I think, Dr. Jules, in your, you mentioned about the ecosystem approach. I think you omitted one aspect. Maybe we can consider it an abstract approach to that ecosystem approach. Mindset. I think, we, I think what is hindering us is the mindset of persons. I'll give you a scenario. On, a, on the bus terminal one day, I looked at a conductor. He had a drink. And when he was finished, he, some of it was still left in the cup. He threw it on the ground. The bin was just one second away from him. 
I said to him, why would you litter? You know what he said? You have people paying to pick up that. Mindset. So if we don't change our mindset, nothing will ever change. I've been teaching for years, and classroom sizes are 40 plus. How do we give, you spoke also about constant um, feedback. How do we give constant feedback when a, one teacher might have over 200 essays to mark for an exam? You know, things like this. We have to be able to change our mindset to education so that we can make the changes necessary to really see any sort of improvement in the system. Okay, don't, don't go yet. Let me ask you a question. So mindset is a problem. How do you change mindset? I did not say it's a problem. It's but a I think key thing. It is, I don't know how that, that, well, actually, I should be asking you that. How do we get persons to change their mindset? Okay. But I'm asking you also because, you see, it's a we thing. So, you see. No, hear me out. When, in the beginning of the, the, the remarks, I said that education is one of the areas where it is hardest to change people's, well, you could use the word mindsets, their, their, their way of thinking. Now, the challenge with that is that what, you, what you're calling for, using the example of the bus driver who littered the, at the bus stand, is exact, yeah, that's just one example, but that's exactly what education is supposed to do, right? That's what you call pure ignorance, right? This is a demonstration of pure ignorance. Now, how do we change that? We change it by what we do from school. This guy probably went through school and like I said, the whole, look at, I give the example in a classroom. If from the classroom, teachers litter, students litter, they expect the cleaners to come after at the end of school and clean up. What do you expect to happen? If on the other hand, you, you inculcate the sense of responsibility. At the end of the day, it's our classroom. We are responsible for keeping it clean. Let's clean it up. Now, you have some parents who will object to that, as I said. But these are necessary things that people need to learn. But do you know we have teachers in the system who might very well be objecting to it as well? Then they shouldn't be teachers. In a new dispensation, they should okay. not be teachers. Okay, exactly. So when I'm, I speak of mindset, it has, I mean, when persons get into education, the mindset should be there as well. I can't find a better word, mindset. No, you're it's correct. You're correct. I, I'll give you an example from my career. When I was PS education in St. Lucia, this child um, cussed out a teacher. So it was a big issue. The education officer for the district intervened. And then the school insisted that I appear before them because they had issues with the education officer because the education officer told the teacher that they were wrong because... They in, we investigated the situation. The child came from a very rough background, a lot of abuse and everything, right? So the child reacted to the teacher in a negative way. We spoke to the child. The child was disciplined. The child came to apologize to the teacher. The teacher refused to accept the apology, right? So the education officer said, well, you are part of the problem because you don't want to, if the child has come to apologize, you don't want to accept the apology. So they decide they escalate in a union and everything start to back up, right? So whole confusion. I went to meet with the teachers. I said, okay, I've come to listen. And that's the point too, when I, when I said, when I was talking about the ministry as a, as a service center, you have to listen carefully to what people are saying because sometimes we listen to respond and we don't listen to understand. So I try to listen to understand. And every teacher in that room, in that school, spoke out, defending the teacher who refused to accept the apology. And when they finished, you know what I said to them? I think, unfortunately, we are at a point in this school where you all should consider retiring as teachers. Because I listened very carefully to what you all said. And in all of what everybody has said, these are the descriptors of the children that give you. describe the children as animals, as hooligans, and not just that child. They were talking generally about the culture of the school. So they're describing them children as animals, as hooligans, as vagabonds, and so on. I say, if you reach that stage, 
in your career where that's the only thing you can see in your students is time to retire right because paulo ferry said that the fundamental job duty of a teacher is to love now that doesn't mean you allow slackness to reign but you have to understand your students understand what their impulse is you have to care for those students sometimes they don't get the love at home they need to get it in the school you know so going forward i think we have to focus a lot on the mindset yeah Thank you. yeah and and okay. and this is not an abstraction because there are a lot of very practical ways we can change mindsets a lot of practical things we can do thank you so very much mr redhead you find you're not getting a question <laughs> okay i have one for you i know we have teachers here i see principals i see parents here we have students here a lot of the data you presented focused or highlighted boys as being a major contributor to juvenile delinquency in your capacity as the deputy commissioner of police what do you think you can <laughs> what can you recommend actually to the teachers the parents the principals and other persons who have a major interest in seeing our education system improve what can you recommend as well, well certainly thank you for first of all involving me <laughs> in the question and answer session but certainly as um, the last person who um, raised the issue of, of transformation uh, i think it's relevant that we understand that in any transformation or change process, one of the things that needs to be adjusted is culture. And it is the elephant in the room that we have not discussed. And not only extant culture, but strategic culture, how that culture evolves into the future in terms of developing and sustaining national ambitions or whatever the ambitions may be. Um, so, and certainly from my experience, culture will eat strategy for breakfast if it's not managed well. Um, and that is where transformation or change has to be centered in terms of changing the extant culture to evolve into the supporting environment that is necessary and important to support all of our aspirations. Relative to the question that you ask in terms of what can we do relative to boys, it, it's a real concern certainly from the Caribbean perspective because the, 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 the crime patterns in the Caribbean are changing rather dramatically. Um, there's, there's, an, there's a phenomenon now called convergence um, where there's a natural connection now between crime for profit ideology um, in terms of it, it forms a perfect storm if you will in terms of how they all work together to, 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 to generate a new kind of criminal if you if if you understand what I'm saying um, the things that we need to do um, certainly in the context of how we can steer young men away from that kind of influence um, is traditionally things that we have been asking um, everyone to do. I mean, we have discussed some of those um, this, this evening in terms of, of, of education, in terms of the guidance, in terms of mentoring, and the range of things that we have traditionally done in terms of providing that kind of influence uh, to steer people away from that kind of um, negative influence and behavior. Um, a lot of it has to do, again, with the culture that exists. Um, and how do we transform that culture into the kind of culture that is, that is necessary to provide the enabling environment relative to how these issues can be addressed in a most sustained manner. And that's, that's the best answer I can give you in that regard. But it, it isn't an easy fix. Um, the sovereign reality is that we all have different perspectives on how to address this issue. Um, and certainly the, the, the collective ideal in terms of how we move forward um, in terms of having a single reference relative to how these issues can be better actualized um, certainly is a discussion point as we go forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Redden. I see we have persons who have burning questions, but we really have to close off this section. We have a cocktail section, and you can ask <laughs> Dr. Dedicus or Mr. Redhead your question at that time. We now ask Dr. Nicole Philip Dow to close off this lecture. Before I say thank you, 
we just want to give a small token of our appreciation to our speakers for this evening. So I will ask Dr. Jules to step forward for one second. Mr. Redhead to step forward for a second. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my job is very easy to say thank you, thank you, thank you for coming this evening. Thank you to our ministers of government who have taken the time off to join us this evening, to our ambassador from the Republic of China. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. To the members of the clergy who are here, both Anglican and Catholic, thank you very much for joining us. To Cooperative Bank, thanks so much again for the sponsorship. To the Bristol family, thank you so much for joining us again this time around. And to all our specially invited guests, thank you for coming. Especially, I want to say thank you to the young people who are here. Could you wave, please? We have a nice group of young people this evening. So we want to thank you so much for coming and being a part of this. Uh, we, have a, we have some refreshment at the back. So we would encourage you to partake. And once again, to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again next year. Um, this time around, we had live streaming of the event. And we want to thank Mr. Oliver and his crew for that. And we want to try and do it again next time around so that we can encourage more people to be a part of the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Have a great evening. COVID-19 spreads from person to person through the droplets that are produced when someone coughs or sneezes, which makes it easy to spread between people in close contact. Now let's get prepared to stay healthy. To reduce your chance of catching or spreading COVID-19, practice these simple everyday preventative measures. Droplets can also land on surfaces, so ensure that you wash your hands frequently for a minimum of 20 seconds or sing the happy birthday song twice. Avoid touching your face, especially your eyes, nose and mouth. If soap and water are not readily available, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with an alcohol content between 60 and 90%. 70% is ideal. When you cough or sneeze, cover your nose and mouth with a flexed elbow or a tissue. Dispose of the tissue immediately and then wash your hands. If you notice someone has a fever and cough or other symptoms of respiratory illness, avoid close contact when possible. Let's all do our part to ensure that each and every Grenadian remains healthy. Our health is our collective responsibility.